Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bob Block. I uh, used to hang out in these parts every once in a while. I'm now an emeritus professor and former chair of our Department of Pediatrics. Uh, and in my new life, which has uh, been working with the, nationally with the American Academy of Pediatrics and also with the Academy on Violence and Abuse, I've had opportunities following my first introduction to Dr. Grundy, which was here in this same room about five or six years ago. We're, we're not quite sure. We've both aged a couple of years uh, in the interim. Uh, but I also had an opportunity recently to work with Paul through the Academy on Violence and Abuse, and uh, our Academy of Pediatrics works very closely with him uh, at, in, during his work as uh, the, pe uh, the president of the Patient-Centered uh, Primary Care Collaborative. Uh, with offices in Washington, D.C., right next to the American Academy of Pediatrics. So it's a great honor for me to be able to, to welcome Paul to Tulsa. Um, you know, I grew up in the 1940s and 50s with a pediatrician father, uh, and my introduction to medicine was all about the patient-centered medical home. Uh, it was often their own home uh, to which my dad would visit, and I would go along to get to know him because otherwise he was working from sunup to uh, the next sunup. Uh, but uh, I recently saw a quote that since those times we've changed, uh, some of us, uh, our approach to patients so that the patient has become sometimes only a vessel for the CPT code. I thought that was really unique and something that will get uh, uh, Paul inflamed enough to give us a great talk this afternoon. Dr. Grundy is the IBM Director of Healthcare Transformation, a critical word, I think, in today's um, um, uh, semantics around medicine. I've mentioned that he's president of the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative. He's also a member of the IBM uh, Industry Academy and the only physician I understand, Paul, unless that's changed recently, on, that works with that group. Uh, he's been a director of the ACGME and a member of the Institute of Medicine for a long while. His MD uh, was awarded through the University of California uh, in San Francisco and his MPH at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, and the list of accomplishments and degrees and letters after his names uh, uh, just could go on uh, forever and ever. But I wanted to mention that when Paul talks about health care and health care delivery, he certainly talks about the medical home, uh, something that's near and dear to the heart of every pediatrician uh, and to the pediatricians here uh, in our department at, at OU Tulsa. Uh, he talks about comprehensive health care and health care that is linked and health care that is integrated. During his talk at the Academy on Violence and Abuse, he introduced me to a new word um, that actually, uh, uh, in the context, was used to define me and most of the physicians that I know. And that word, Paul, was partialist. Uh, and that certainly grabbed my attention, and I've been using it and discussing it with people uh, ever since that. Uh, Paul, as, as you know, is affiliated uh, with uh, IBM uh, and is in charge of several billions of dollars spent on health care benefits. And with that much, uh, money invested, certainly uh, the industry uh, is uh, um, interested in getting uh, the most care that they can for their dollar. Uh, as a pediatrician interested in primary care, uh, my connection with Paul and with the rest of you is, is to remind you that all adults, once we're children, preventive care begins in childhood uh, and has to continue. Uh, throughout the lifespan, because if we do that, uh, then we will be able to transform not only the care that our patients receive, but the cost of that care. And we need to do that in order to have economic success uh, to keep this country on its feet. So without further ado from me, it is a great honor, Paul, to have you here again uh, at uh, the OU School of Community Medicine and within the, the community of Tulsa. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back. <clears throat> this is my fourth or fifth time here, and I would like to start by, by telling you that <clears throat> you're never a prophet in your own country. Um, I, I brag about the work that you guys have done here in Tulsa. Um, everywhere I go, I was just in um, China uh, two weeks ago, I met with some of the leadership of the Ministry of Health and various levels of the Chinese engagement. I, I'm actually surprised that some of them didn't come here to Tulsa to see what you're doing because I, I mean, I think that, that you're the first academic medical center in the country that has adopted the medical home as the template for your education change. Your, your whole process of education is built on the concept of moving away from delivering an episode of care 
towards managing a population down to the individual level in a healing relationship. Um, and that's very unique. Also unique to you here in, in Tulsa, in the Tulsa community, is that you happen to have one of the most exciting Beacon community grants that's, that's going on in My Health Access. Um, you happen to also have one of only seven of the Centers for Medicare, Medicare Innovation grants in the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative. You've got your payers beginning to align around paying for the right thing. Um, so you, you've got a lot of exciting uh, transformation that's happening here uh, in Tulsa. Um, so it's, it's a real privilege to be with you. I also want to thank AbbVie Labs for sponsoring this meeting. Um, they've, been, they've been very instrumental as part of the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative Executive um, in, in making folks available to talk about the concept of transformation. <clears throat> so there are three things that are really driving the whole concept of the medical home, of the whole concept of moving towards managing a population down to the individual level and moving away from delivering only an episode of care. And the first, and probably one of the most visible to most po folks, are folks like IBM as a buyer of care, you know, who are really looking for a very different value proposition in the care that we get. You see, healthcare cost trends have been enormously high. We are not only at the cliff, we are over the cliff in the United States. The last 10 years, the affordability gap has widened increasingly more and more. RAND uh, Foundation did a study that they published this year, which basically says that every single dime of earned income improvement in the past 10 years has been absorbed completely and then some by escalating healthcare costs, which is not sustainable. Anybody read The Bitter Pill? Anybody see the hour-long thing on 60 minutes, right? I mean, what we're seeing is increasingly more and more consumers being aware of this because that cost has been, over the past decade, passed much more visibly to the consumer. Um, so you see a huge backlash of that. So... We... We have, we have this sort of data that increasingly is available to us. I have the privilege of, of uh, visiting a medical home facility um, probably about two months ago. This one was in Riverside, California. And in Riverside, California, in that medical home, the gap in delivering breast cancer screening was no longer at 75%. It was at 7.5%. Right? You know, the Institute of Medicine did, did a study on those services that should be delivered in an effective healthcare delivery system. And a little over half were, right? So those screens that should be done, those tests that should be done, that prenatal care that should be done, um, what was actually delivered was close to half. And by the way, it, it's actually worse for those who have good health insurance than it is for those who don't, because those who have good health care insurance are also seen as an opportunity to milk in the system, right? So, so that wasn't a significant advantage. But all of a sudden, in that practice in California, we're at 87% of those tests that should be delivered being delivered in a medical home environment, right? So to put it in simple terms, 
put it in personal terms. When I moved um, to New York about eight years ago, we took our cat to the veterinarian. <laughs> and a month or so later, our cat was notified that it needed its immunizations. Why? Because our cat had a registry. The vet had a registry. But I went into my primary care provider's office, a really nice guy, right? A family physician. And I asked him the question, how many women in your practice who are 55 or over have not had their breast exam? And he looked at me and he said, Paul, I don't know how many women are in my practice. I certainly don't know how many are 55 or over. And I have no clue who's had their breast exam and who's not had their breast exam. You know, we started on a journey in that Hudson Valley as an employer. We started on a journey with the healthcare plans. We started on a journey with the docs to move them to a medical home. And three years ago, my primary care physician became an NCQA certified medical home. He has a registry. And my wife was actually notified that she needed her breast exam. She had her breast exam done, and it was positive. She had a mastectomy. And it was caught at an early enough time in her natural history of that disease that her prognosis is extremely good. Right? That's what I'm talking about. Right? It isn't complicated. It's not rocket science. It's, it's, it's beginning to think about how you manage a population. You know, It's aspirin. It's blood pressure. It's cholesterol. You know, It's this kind of stuff that should be addressed and it's not being addressed that's killing us. You see, we are dead last in the developing economy. We are dead last of all the developing economies in terms of 15 years of life lived after age 40. And we're dead last at twice the price of any other developed economy. Why? Because we failed to understand the value of proactive, robust primary care that's used to manage a population with. And that's what you guys figured out here in Tulsa, the University of Oklahoma <clears throat> School of Community Medicine. Uh, that's what Dean Duffy and Clarence Clancy and your leadership have begun to lead all those years ago, and you're beginning to reap the results here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's very, very exciting. Does that make sense to everybody? That, that, that's simply what we're talking about. So um, when, when I begin to ask my population when I begin to talk to them about what is it that they want, what is it they want out of a delivery system of value? Almost universally, what they tell me is that they want access. I want to be able to get to my doc when I need my doc. I want to have an engagement with my doc in a real relationship. I would love to have my doc answer the email, right? I would love to have an opportunity to have a very different mechanism of communicating with my doc. Um, but in our population, only about 26% of our employees could access their doctor after hours. So what happens to you when you can't access your doc after hours? You know, you end up in the emergency room, and that's not a very healthy place to end up. Um, that's not a very good use of the emergency room if it's not an emergency, right? So I get telephone calls from, from my patients asking me, you know, I, have, I tried to get in to see my primary care doc, but you know, he won't be able to see me for three weeks. And I say, maybe you need a new primary care doc. Maybe you need somebody who has a concept of service of actually seeing you when you need to be, see, when you need to be seen. Um, so we begin to have a very different view of, of what it is um, that the patient wants. And it's really important, really, really important that you begin this conversation with that understanding of what is it 
that's important to the patient. So why? Why do we think that primary care and a relationship with a healer is fundamental and foundational to the delivery system of value? I mean, what's intuitive about that? You know, I, I grew up in Africa. My parents were missionaries and the, the traditional healer, right? The power of the traditional healer, the power of a healing relationship. It's something that's built into humanity. I mean, you know, the mother goddess, right? You do archaeological digs back 40,000 years. You know, every culture has a healer. Not only does every culture have a healer, but every culture has an incredibly important relationship of what that healer is to culture. Why? Because we're all going to get sick, we're all going to die. I mean, it's something profoundly powerful and needed. When you do surveys, when we do surveys of our patients and we ask them, who's the most trusted individual in their life? They will tell you first their family, and second, their primary care physician or their healer. Why would I want to disintermediate that relationship? Why would I not want to use that relationship to amplify and cadence a, a very different value proposition, and that's the value proposition of a, of a comprehensive healing relationship that we can build value on? I had an employee um, tell me he was lucky enough to have the same primary care doc for over 20 years. And he told me, you know, for 20 years, my primary care doc has been telling me to stop smoking. And I finally stopped. That's what I want to buy. You know, that's what I want to buy. I want to buy somebody who will amplify in cadence a message of health that many of us as employers are trying to communicate to our employees. I want that to be amplified and cadenced in a healing relationship of trust as a primary care. So the medical home is really a place in the delivery system, as we think about it, that becomes a system integrator. You see, for the first time in history, the second element of all of this that's going to happen is data. For the first time in history, we're going to have the data to manage a population with. Anybody see that Watson thing where, 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 where the Jeopardy game was? You know, 300 million pages of information in 0.3 microseconds that's learned, that's cognitive, that's going to be, that's going to be transmitted to the point of care. I mean, where, where in the delivery system is that going to go and be held accountable? Pro probably not. You know, probably not, you know, to your cosmetic surgeon. I mean, you know, we really begin to think about, you know, what is the various roles that healers play in society? They, they play really three roles, right? So you have somebody who really gets good at delivering care around a part of the body. You know, they get good at doing hips, they get good at doing knees, you know, and we value that. I mean, that's really important. They do great liver transplants, right? Um, and and they, they, they are what I call a specialist in a part of the body, or as you defined, a partialist, right? So, so the, the next sort of uh, option that you have as a healer is you can be a comprehensivist. You can specialize in the comprehensive management of a, of a patient and a population. And in most of the world, that's your GPs, that's your family medicine docs, that's your general pediatricians, your general internists, right? Um, not so clear cut in this society. There's kind of a divide between that. And there's a third category that one can be as a healer, and that's a principal care provider, but not really willing to be the comprehensivist. You know, so you have the diabetologist that wants to really manage diabetes in a population, and they they become the person who most of the time that person with diabetes sees, but they're not going to be focused on making sure that the breast exams are done and the immunizations are done, right? So, so from the perspective of a buyer of care, I want all of my employees to at least have a comprehensivist, you know, somebody who's going to manage the total care of a population. 
And, you know, that's what a primary care doc should be by definition, right? That's their role in life. That's what they signed up for. If you're a specialist in endocrinology, you know, you can kind of decide whether you really want to be able to manage comprehensively a population or you want to just focus on being a consultant. You know, and if, by the way, all you do is backs, right? You're unlikely to really want to be a comprehensivist. And they're, so what's dangerous to me, what's dangerous to us, is when we have employees that will have five partialists and no comprehensivist, right? So we have somebody who has, you know, who's being treated for their liver disease, for their pulmonary disease, and for their endocrine disease, and they're being given medicines by five different people, and there's no adult supervision. I mean, that's dangerous, that's toxic, that's deadly. Um, and that happens, right, every day, right? That's, that's really not what we want to buy. Um, I, I happen to be on the, the board of the organization that certifies residency training programs, and you know, we made a big stink about this the last time we had a meeting. It is inappropriate to train a specialist without teaching them that part of their job, part of their role is to make sure that they catch and respond back to, in some way or another, somebody who's managing a population. It is unethical. It is immoral. It is unacceptable. You know, for you to do an episode of care on somebody without either being willing to manage comprehensively that care or be willing to pass the buck and coordinate appropriately when need be. It is deadly, it's toxic. So this is like one of my favorite slides. This has made it into every slide deck anybody's ever done about medical home. And this slide was done by Dan Duffy. Stand up, Dan. He snuck out. I was going to make him get up here and explain this slide, and I wouldn't have to do it. But literally, this thought process came right here from you guys, right? And this, this is the core principles of what we're talking about, right? So we're really talking about, you know, moving away from an episode of care towards managing a patient, managing a population. You know, we're really talking about moving towards planned care, we're really talking about moving towards team-based care. So my very first, or maybe my second, but one of my early meetings here, you had a big tent on the lawn by the library, and you had, anybody remember that? Anybody here for that? At least somebody's got to be here. To, but you had a big tent on the lawn, and you had your students that were just completing, having, having done, you remember, right? Having done community service, where they went out and they worked in a community health center, they went, and they came back and they told their stories about working in a community service organization. And then they went to their very first class. And it's Introduction to Clinical Medicine. It's where you learn to do chief complaint. <laughs> I remember that very well in medical school, 1974. And we had a you know, a poor patient who would tolerate having four medical students trying to learn how to do a chief complaint from him, right? All you guys remember that? Here, it was different. Here, you had a nursing student, you had a pharmacy student, you had a behavioralist, and you had a medical student. It was a team of four. And that team of four was asking the question, what is your chief complaint? And what did that tell the medical student? What did that tell everybody in that community? That from now on, this was going to be a team sport. This wasn't a solo concept anymore. We were moving away from delivering an episode of care stored in somebody's head as a master builder to a concept where we're going to have a team and we're going to use data to manage a population from. Very, very exciting. So the, the fundamental foundation 
You hear a lot about accountable care. Accountable care organizations. Um, the fundamental foundation that's, by the way, in the law, that's in the core concept of accountable care is the medical home as the foundation of that, right? So if you look at the accountable, if the law, it says, what is accountable care organization? It's at least 5,000 primary care patients, right? So do you know what you call an accountable care organization that doesn't have a medical home as its fundamental building block, as its fundamental unit? It's no longer an ACO, it's a UCO, right? It's an un unaccountable care organization. And, and there's actually quite a few folks that when I, when I travel the country and talk about this concept, you know, they, they really want to be an unaccountable care organization. They really don't have a concept of managing a population. I visited a, a large academic medical center not too long ago that was talking about becoming an accountable care organization and, and they were building this gigantic new wing to their, to their hospital. And I, I said, do you get it? Do you guys understand that a bed in an accountable care organization is no longer a profit center, it's a cost center? I mean, do you, you understand that you, you know, you're basically signing up to say, I'm gonna take risk? I mean, you know, that's the transition of thought. So, I mean, fundamentally, fundamentally, the basic building block, and again, it's pretty well documented in the literature, it's pretty well written about, is the building blocks that you guys began here those five or six years ago when you redesigned your curriculum around the medical home as the foundation of that. And that's a place into the system where at the individual level, Somebody is responsible for managing a population, including, by the way, eventually total cost. I just don't know how else you can do it. I don't know where else you can do it. There's no other system in the world that works without having proactive, robust primary care as the foundation of the delivery system. So we've done huge number of pilots now. So the last time I, the first time I spoke here, we had just formed the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative and how did that come about and what's happened since is a bit of the journey that, that I'd like to talk about. So we brought together 47 of the Fortune 100 companies in Washington, D.C we began talking among ourselves about what we were buying, what we wanted to buy, and could we get a change of covenant? Could we begin a very different conversation and where would we start that conversation from? So what we wanted to be able to buy was being able to manage a population. What we didn't want to buy is a system that would look upon our patients as body parts and opportunities to milk. Um, so we, we, we decided that we really fundamentally needed to shift how we interfaced with primary care. So we asked the House of Primary Care, we brought them to the table. We brought the pedi pediatricians, we brought family medicine, we brought the osteopaths, and we brought the internists to the table. And we said, we would like a change of covenant. We would like to move away from an episode of care to managing a population. And the first person to speak in that room that day was Doug Hanley. Anybody here family medicine? A few of you? Doug Hanley said, you know, we did this study of ourselves. We called it the future of family medicine, where we did a dive on ourselves around the kind of care we were delivering, and we came to the same conclusion you did, that our real role is to manage a population, our real role is to deliver comprehensive care, and we're not doing that because, by the way, you, you're not paying us to do that, you're paying us still to do an episode of care. And bless your hearts, he said, I now know it means two things in Southern language, bless your hearts that you coming to us and asking this because we were gonna go to you. And the general internist said, you know, we have had the same conversation. We had a big 
meeting that was convened by the American Board of Internal Medicine. We did a big look at ourselves. And we reached the conclusion that we needed a concept called the advanced medical home where our populations managed to do this with. Pediatricians, Fran Tate, you know Fran, right? Bless her heart. Both ways. Um, you know, she, she said, you know, we pediatricians thought of this idea 38 years ago, you know? Calvin Chai wrote about this in 68 in the pediatric literature. Nobody listened to us, right? So we, the buyers, said to the house of primary care, give us a set of principles that you all agree on, right? That are, that, that are, that are all of your principles, right? That, that, that we can then begin to drive. Um, and literally, that was how the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative was born. Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative was born really when Angel, who was the HR director for benefits for the Dell Corporation, at the very end of the meeting, spoke up and said, we love this idea. We love these principles. We think it's great. How do we buy it? Where's the 8 by 5 glossy? Where's the healthcare benefit plan that can sell us this? And there wasn't one. Right? Because we were still buying an episode of care. So, what do we do next? We formed the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative. And then we invited all the healthcare plans to the table. So we had Blue Cross Blue Shield. HCSC was, was there separately, which is your Blue Cross Blue Shield Association here. Anybody here from any of the plans? Um, we, had, we had United, we had Aetna, we had Humana, so we had all the large buyers in the room, payers in the room. And an interesting thing happened in that conversation. Sam Nesselbaum, the CMO for WellPoint, and Paul, the CMO, CMO from HCSC at the time, both said, you know, look, this makes eminent sense. This is the business we should be in because we're in the business of managing a population. That's what we should be doing. And the guy from United, um, Sandy, Sandy Lewis, or Lewis Sandy, I always confuse first name and last name, said, you need to hold our feet to the fire. Because somehow we're going to have to play together. And we're going to have to play together nicely if this is going to work. So we'll do a press release where we all agree to do this. And we, the buyers, said to the healthcare plans, if you don't do a pilot around this, and you don't start it in one year, none of us will buy from you next year. And we agreed. We did a press release around that uh, October of that year. And so many, many pilots were started. And these are some of the results, right? I mean, it's really exciting. I just got the most recent results from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan the largest pilot we have going, um, you know, we saw a 32% reduction in hospitalization for ambulatory sensitive conditions. I mean, duh. I mean, if you manage upstream, ABCs, aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol, you're going you're gonna to begin to see downstream results. Very consistent, and there's now been literally hundreds of, of, of papers that have been written on it. There was just last month alone an entire issue of family medicine on some of the results. But I would say there's probably papers that come out, great article in Consumer Report that just came out today on some of this. So we're beginning to see very consistent data. When you begin to apply some of the principles you know, in, consistent, in a consistent way. I learned today that that in the Medicare population here, those folks who use My Health Access, right, which is one of the components of the medical home here, the average cost is like down $22 for each of the Medicare uh, recipients. Um, you know, we've seen places around the country where we've seen trend lines down by 
11% in total cost. We've seen companies who have done on-site, near-site medical home, which, you know, significant decrease in trend lines. I think we have a lot of work to do in this arena. I think that, that all the answers aren't in. I think that what is in is that if you begin to look at how you manage a population effectively, you can begin to see um, significant results in that population. Um, the other thing that we've seen is that in many parts of the country, we've seen significant improvement in physician satisfaction. Um, in this practice I visited here, the last time I was here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I sat next to a young lady um, who was the care manager for a patient. And she looked at me and she smiled and she said, you know this patient that I'm calling right now, I just saved her life. Same story as my wife, right? Breast cancer. Um, and she just beamed. I mean, she was like empowered, right? And in that practice, the doctor was telling me, you know, I now have a team that supports me. I don't feel so alone. I don't feel so disempowered. I'm beginning to practice at the top of my license. I'm beginning to do the things that I need to do with my time. Um, University of Utah, where they've had a medical home now for 11 years, I'm on the faculty there. We begin, to, we begin to have a conversation with the primary care docs about them doing two things with their time and two things only. Difficult diagnostic dilemmas and relationships. So in team-based care, you know, the care coordinators do what the care coordinators do. The nurse case managers do what the nurse case managers do. The MAs do what the MAs do. You know, and by the way, the doctors don't type. The MAs type. I mean, what a stupid use of a doctor's time, you know? They have their butt in the patient's face and they're typing, right? I mean, you know, you begin to actually have people beginning to practice at the top of their license. So you begin to see satisfaction. The only place in the country that I'm aware of that the physicians actually drove this, really drove this, was in the Adirondacks. It's a big shield of mountains in, in, in New York, small towns, Lake Placid where they had the Olympics, beautiful, beautiful community. 157 primary care docs are there and they were hemorrhaging them, right? They were just deserting. They were losing three or four docs a year because they couldn't sustain themselves. They were frustrated. They went and sat in the Commissioner of Health's office in Albany and said to the payers, said to the buyers, if you want us to continue to deliver care, you're going to have to provide the copper wire where we can do medical home level care because that's all we're going to sell anymore. We're not going to sell an episode of care for a diabetic. It's unethical to sell an episode of care for a diabetic. A diabetic needs to be managed. And you need to help us have the infrastructure to do that. They're in their third year now of medical home. This year, they have five new doctors who have moved in. It, it, it really begins to stabilize the population for, for the physicians. It's really exciting when you see a medical home and you see it work all over the country. Across the border next door to you, I visited a medical home practice in a small town in Arkansas. You know, there was a, a doc who had, you know, was pretty much demoralized. Um, single family, single primary care doc. He's now in a CPCI practice. He has a little EMR called Soapware. You know, he dictates and he just talks in his room and it gets captured by his medical assistant who does all the typing, right? He's earning $156,000 more a year, right? Blue Cross Blue Shield is beginning to pay the right way, you know, but he's saving that community a huge amount of money in terms of cost. All of a sudden, you know, he's like thrilled about staying in practice. So we're beginning to see that happen all over the country. It's, it's, it's very exciting.
So if we're going to get at this, three things have to change. We talked about practices changing, right? Practices are going to have to move away from an episode of care towards managing a population. And how we pay them has got to change. If you only pay them fee for service, you're going to get too many services. If you only pay them capitation, you might get too little services, right? So how do you begin to look at, you know, structuring payment to begin to get at a better value proposition to align the, the change in the practice with how you pay? I, I think that's not rocket science either. If you only have one dial, I don't care whether it's capitation or fee for service. You only have one dial. You know, you have very little control over managing it, right? If you have multiple dials, you know, you don't have to get it right 100% the first time. But, you know, if you overpay a bit in this category, you can back that down and you can back the other one up, right? So, you know, one of the places that I visited begins to pay against three dials. They begin to pay around capitation, Right? for managing a population, they're beginning to pay around fee for services for those services you want done in primary care. Right? If you want moles removed in primary care, if you, want, if you want colon scoped in primary care, you don't want them to be pushed upstream or downstream, however you look at it, you know, then you, begin to, you, you want fee for service there to encourage that. And the third thing, which was really cool, is service level. I mean, if you want your emails answered, Reward that, right? So they get five times as much money if they answer their email in 20 minutes than if they answer it in 24 hours. Right? So if you if you've structured a mechanism by which by which you know you have a process in place to, to really empower patients to be seen the same day, you know, you make more money, right? Because that's that's what the patients want, right? So so again, I, I don't think any of this is rocket science. I don't think any of this is something that absolutely has to happen anywhere. But I just think if you begin to think about what dials you need to put in place because you want the results of the payment to change that, um, you know, that's a lot, a lot you can begin to impact in terms of aligning payment for outcomes, right? Um, I think North Dakota is probably the furthest along in, in terms of any state. I think every one of the practices in North Dakota are a medical home now. And uh, I think the last practice in Bismarck just signed up because they didn't get a change in fee-for-service in four years. No, no uptick in fee-for-service. If you delivered a medical home, you made 14% more money, but no uptick in fee-for-service. Hawaii, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield in Hawaii, uh, the same. Uh, so we're beginning to see places that are really beginning to shift away from fee-for-service towards managing a population more effectively. The third thing, the third component uh, of that tri triad, you know, if you're going to change how practices practice, you're going to change how you pay them, I think the third thing that you really need to do is restructure benefits in a way that in sense the patient's doing the right thing. Right? So if you pay, if you have a $20 co-deductible or your $20 copay, I mean, that's not much of an incentive. I've seen exciting new programs in value-based benefit design where whole states are beginning to ask the question around how do I incent the patient to do the right thing? I, I was in Michigan and the University of Michigan and as an employer, you know, they use a pedometer, they hook it up to the cell phone and they did a pilot where they did it, looked at it three ways. In the first group of patients, they got the cell phone for free they got to use the pedometer. They got the information about you know, exercise and the benefit of that. Didn't cost the patients anything. The second population got the cell phone. They got the pedometer. And they got a significant deduction in their benefit cost. And the third got the cell phone. They got the pedometer. But they got psychological rewards inserted into that by having a program in place where 
the patients were, or the population, the consumers, were messaged about how they were doing around their exercise, right? Every week. You know, incented, encouraged, little messages to, to, to sort of incent them, encourage them. They were engaged in teams that competed with each other. And, you know, at the end of the year, 17% of patients who got the free cell phone service still used it. But that third group, over 87%, were in beginning to get engaged and were beginning to see the risk factors decrease because of exercise. Again, one simple solution. Is that my phone? No. Um, so, benefit redesign, practice redesign, payment redesign are the three legs of the stool for us to move away from an episode of care towards effectively managing a population. And that requires input from all of us, right? It requires engagement of our patients. It requires engagement of our physicians. It requires engagement of our payers. It requires engagement of our plans. Not easy. Not easy. So we talked about the three elements that were driving this change. We talked about one being unsustainable cost. We talked about two being data. Data being made actionable for the first time. And the third element of this that's driving this globally is a massive change in how communication is occurring. You see, we're still in a world, basically, largely, in which the last tool that was developed to really enhance communication with your doctor is still what we pay for. And that's the use of the automobile. You know, we pay when the doctor sees the whites of your eyes. You know, we used to be that the, that encounter occurred because the doctor could do a house call because he had a car. And then our patients all had a car, and we stopped doing house calls, and then they came to us. But basically, the expectation is, just like 20 years ago, you went to the bank to do a teller engagement. You go to your doctor to have an encounter. And that's changing rapidly. Um, my kids, who are 25 and 30, have never seen a teller. They do it all this way, right? You know, I was just recently in Denmark, and 82% of the encounters are asynchronous now, right? I was just at a Kaiser practice, and over half of the engagements are asynchronous. You know, where there's a vastly different mechanism of communication, including, by the way, devices that monitor you. So in Denmark, when you take your pill for your diabetic disease, when you push the, the pill through the aluminum foil, right, that activates a sensor which tells your cell phone, which tells your PHR, which tells your physician that you took the pill. That's an asynchronous communication, right? That's, that's a tool that begins to monitor a population. By the way, think about it. Think about it. You know, if you're an asthmatic, you know, you know that you didn't take your medicine. Pharmacist knows you didn't take your medicine because he didn't fill it. The only person that doesn't know that you didn't take your medicine is probably your doctor, right? Because he... You know, he's not in the loop. Let's put him back in the loop. And let's make him accountable for managing you and helping you manage yourself more effectively is, 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 is what is beginning to happen. But, you know, we put a little, a little uh, solution together a few years ago. Um, I was just personally passionate about it because I happen to know this little place. It's called Tristan de Kunis, the most remote inhabited island. I, I love remote travel. Remote inhabited island on the face of the earth. And we hooked them up to the, via internet, satellite, to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And most of their encounters are now done in a video conferencing booth. Right? And you can do a tremendous amount remotely um, and we're beginning to pay for that. Here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you have solutions that you've developed that the rest of the world is looking at. I mean, one is doc to doc, right? Where you actually pay the specialists to answer the email, and we begin to see a 40% reduction in the number of times a patient has to go and see a rheumatologist. We begin to see the rheumatologist for the first time not have a four-month waiting list, right? Because you know, of a little technology and a change in 
statement to incent that. You know, my patients love that. I mean, when my patients have to go see a specialist, it takes them a day or half a day at least to do that, right? You know, and if they don't have to do that because the primary care doc has just simply asked a question, and much of the time that is one of continue doing the right thing and add this, right? But who really loves it are the specialists. Because they're spending 40% of their time in what they call weeding. And weeding is when you see a patient who's self-referred to you, and it's not your specialty to treat, right? <laughs> and you know that's a huge waste of time, energy, effort, and resources. Um, I think I'd like to stop because I tend to talk forever and wander on and, and really have some questions. The last time I was here, I had some very interesting questions and the hardest pushback I've had from anywhere in the country. So I would love to begin to have a dialogue and stop you know, just monologuing here. So first thought, first question. Hi, I'm an international board certified lactation consultant and I feel like I'm a bridge between the mother's doctor and the baby's doctor. And what can we do to really get coordination so that the breastfeeding relationship, this physiologic relationship between mother and baby gets the support, the medical support that it needs in a timely fashion? I think you're in the right place because I think this is a community that really begins to understand team-based care. Um, and I think your question is very important because how, how do you fit in in your area of expertise um, in terms of really the comprehensive management of a patient is I think what you're getting at in terms of your, your question. Um, again, I mean, I think, I think it isn't rocket science. I think when the system begins to understand that this is a team sport, that the physicians are no longer paid to do an episode of care. I mean, why have they been ignoring you so far? They've been ignoring you so far, by and large, because when they pay attention to you, they lose money. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, because because by the way, you know, they're rewarded for doing an episode. Whether that episode of care is needed or not, that's how they're rewarded. But if they're rewarded for the health of that baby and the health of that mother, if that becomes a significant component of the reward system, and by the way, you know, they begin, because they train at a place like this where they begin to think about this is a team sport, you know, the relationship you're gonna have with them is gonna be very, very different, right? Yes, and there, there's a real difficulty with continuity of awareness of lactation risk factors and so on. It's just not showing up in medical records. And, yeah. And so, you know, there, there's just so many gaps in the coordination. So you're a pediatrician here in the community. How does she, how does she uh, begin to sort that out? How does she interface with My Health Access? How do they begin to get that sort of data into your system to for her to really add value. Uh, well, Paul, I think you, you hit on the answer when you were talking about the, 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 the provider, the purchaser, and the, and the, the payer seller. Because the biggest uh, reality uh, difficulty, and it's not just here, but it's anywhere, is that um, th there's not a synchronous movement toward population management and time spent doing that and payment for the time. So once um, a practice could uh, put the lactation consultant, for example, as an important part of the team, and that team would meet and do patient-centered rounds, who are our patients who have lactation issues, and everyone on the team was paid for the time it took to have that meeting, then I think the problem would be solved. Yeah. So as you've been talking about having all of those players at the table at the same time, I think that's the answer. It's not a matter of having a service like that lactation consultant that's being ignored because it's undervalued. It's, um, it's undervalued by the payers, and therefore there's, there's not an initiative or an incentive uh, for that team to form and, and practice in the, in the ultimate uh, best, best way.
So in My Health Access and tools like Doc to Doc, right, that you are using here, you know, and the payers begin to say to you, yes, we would like to wrap in lactation management. How do you interface with her? How do you create the kinds of tools so that the pediatricians and, and the OBGYNs and the folks that, that begin to deal with that kind of issue are aware that that service is there? And by the way, how much of that service can be done remotely? I bet a lot of it can be done remotely. I bet a lot of it would just be encouraging the pediatrician to do the right thing, but you know that's between you, the two of you, to decide. But you know, think about that. I mean, again, that's just a simple little example. And there are many others, but I, I suspect that you know she could be available to add a huge amount more value in the system if it was integrated. Question. The, 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 the building blocks? Yeah, I think that the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative is very well aligned with the concept of the medical home. Again, you know, for the first time you have the largest payer beginning to understand and reward the primary care docs for managing a population uh, in an effective manner. Now, do I think that they're all aligned perfectly? No, but, but, but I, think, I think because they have a dial in place that's different, that dial is a per, per, month, per month payment and potential shared saving, that, that as time goes on, that dial can be adjusted a bit you know, up or down one way or the other because you have multiple dials. I think that the, the fact that you're a CPCI community is gonna help you a lot here because you're gonna begin to have some momentum build um, with that particular payer, which who is a significant payer in this community, uh, beginning to align, you know, with, with some of the other commercial payers in paying in a different direction. Um, do I think it's a journey? I do, right? I mean, I, I think that none of us have the answer that's like, you know, this is the perfect way to do it. Um, but, I, but I think if you just begin to think about having multiple dials, I think the other thing that I've seen in some other states, like the example of the Adirondacks or like the example in Arkansas, in this primary care doc that is a single practice primary care doc that's in that CPCI program over in Arkansas, he's making $156,000 more a year. I mean, he's likely to stay in practice for 10 more years. Um, and, and by the way, overall costs are down, even though he's, he's, he's uh, improved his lot in life a little bit. Um, so so th those are kind of some exciting things I'm beginning to see. The other thing I'm beginning to see that's quite interesting is that we're beginning to see Michigan, which is four or five years down the road, we're beginning to see primary care specialists who begin to have a focus. So you begin to see primary care physicians who all of a sudden, because they're rewarded for managing a compl complicated population, who have an inclination to want to do that, Right? Whereas before they would lose money if they did that. You know, you begin to see these practices that really begin to evolve in what I would call ambulatory intensive care units, where they really begin to think about how they manage those most difficult patients. And then you see another group of primary care physicians who might really want to focus on keeping the well well, right? Where you don't need to spend a lot of time with each individual patient, but you can have a larger community. We're beginning to see a bit of, I wouldn't call it specialization, but a bit of focus change with certain practices having focuses in one area and other practices in another area, which I hadn't predicted, I haven't really thought about, but I begin to see that happen. Is that happening here a bit in Tulsa as well? Have you seen some of that transformation beginning to occur? Um, yes? So, so actually, I visited North Carolina a lot, um, 
And, and I don't frankly know um, whether or not the cost data is, is you know, is, is certainly perfect um, or, or there isn't debate. What I do know is that when I go out into the communities and I visit both the patients and the doctors, they love it. Um, you know, interestingly enough, in North Carolina, community care in North Carolina became a locus for employers. So employers began to work with Blue Cross Blue Shield and some other carriers in North Carolina, and they actually began to purchase into that community care process for the care coordination. So, I mean, there's elements, I think, of, of what I see in North Carolina that are really exciting. Another example of that would be Vermont. Vermont is another example where you have a community kind of organization supporting the medical home movement. So if you're not familiar with it, what, what North Carolina has done is they've created not-for-profits, I think 13 of them across the state, and those not-for-profit agencies begin to coordinate care for the Medicaid population. And now this commercial author, opportunity working through Blue Cross Blue Shield to do that as well, and Kerr and GlaxoSmithKline and a few other companies are using that you know, commercial model. Um, and so, so the care coordination is being done you know, on behalf of the physicians by these community organizations, these not-for-profit community organizations, which sort of work with the healthcare plan to do the coordination. Um, Vermont is, is another example. Blueprint for Health is, is it. I, 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 they've, ARC has just done a video on St. Johnsbury, Vermont. And I went up to Vermont about three months ago. Um, and what they've done there is they've taken 1.9 cents of, out, out of every sick care dollar. So every time you pay a dollar in sick care, 1.9 cents goes to this not-for-profit community organization. Again, like community care, similar organization. But, but this organization doesn't do the care coordination at the patient level. That's actually done by the practice there. It's a different sort of arrangement. It actually communicates and coordinates across the entire community a plan for every patient, right? So, so every month, the police department, the churches, the goodwill industries, all the not-for-profits kind of come together, and they organize how they're going to respond as a community to support better care and better health in the community. So I have a diabetic. The diabetic is duly diagnosed. And the doctor's office, through the care coordination community, can notify a not-for-profit organization in this town, which has organized a hiking trail for diabetics. And they meet on Tuesday, and they go for a hike. And they notify the local shopping shop mart or whatever the name of the grocery store is because there's a nutritionist that works in those grocery stores that, that every Wednesday does a tour through the grocery store and talks about nutrition and cooking and eating. And the Goodwill industry can supply a coat. <laughs> but, but literally every patient has a plan wrapped around them from, from the perspective of a community. And I think here in Tulsa you have a lot of those elements, right? You have the largest amount of money per capita contributed by foundation money in this community. Um, you have lots of organizations that you know, could, could actually participate together around creating a plan around each patient. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I, I haven't really focused on the issue of you know, how cost effective is this? Because I don't care. I want my patients managed. It's unacceptable not to manage them. It's unethical not to manage them. I know for a fact that if you look broadly around the value of primary care, and that's a slide here, that those folks who are lucky enough to have a comprehensive assist, their primary care physician, that's who sees them on a regular basis, their mortality for that 15-year window from age 40 to 55 is 19% lower and they cost us one third less money. You know, that's just primary care. That's not even medical home. That's just robust primary care. You know, when that study came out in the Commonwealth Fund, where, where they looked at those 19, those 15 years of life, the Canadian Minister of Health said, you know, we, you know, we shouldn't crow about the fact that we're doing so much better than the Yanks. Hmm? Because, by the way, they're dead last 
but we're right behind them. And everybody knows that the real value of delivery system is how robust that primary care is. You know, and, and we need a lot of improvement in Canada, but the Yanks, they don't have one at all. You know, beating them, he said, is like beating a bunch of midgets blindfold in a basketball game. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, that was his quote. I, by the way, I'm not supposed to say that quote because it's derogatory to midgets. But. I frankly don't know what Walmart's going to do. I don't think any of us do. I've worked with them, so I don't know the answer to that. I do know Walgreens and CVS, what they are doing, what they think they want to do at this stage. Um, Walgreens acquired, um, acquired three or four of the largest on-site, near-site occupational medicine programs. I visited, I visited a, a Walgreens clinic um, in... New Orleans, um, next to Harrods Casino, right? So it's an employee-based um, clinic. And I visited a Walgreens practice in uh, Silver Springs, Maryland, Adventist Hospital, where the Walgreens guys actually take somebody from their take care medical clinic, and they go to the hospital on discharge, and they deliver the medication that that patient needs at the time of discharge, go over the medication with the patient at the time of discharge, and then follow them up from the take care clinic. And we've seen in that particular hospital, we saw a drop in the return after one month from 11 the previous month to one the next month, right? Because somebody was actually managing that population. Now, that's exciting to me, and I think that's interesting, but if it's really gonna work, then they're going to somehow have to integrate into the medical home, right? They're going to have to integrate that care into the ongoing comprehensive care. Otherwise, it's just another piece of managing for a short period of time. And that's the message that I keep telling to my colleagues at CVS and Walgreens and Walmart. Um, if they're really going to have an impact, then they need to really begin to think about what they're going to deliver in the store or what they're going to deliver at the factory site somehow integrating into, into a mechanism of comprehensive care. If it's integrated, it'll add value. If it's not integrated, it'll be fragmented. So IBM thought long and hard about creating its own corporate concierge medical home, right? Like Harrods has done, like many other companies has done. You know, if you can't buy it, build it, right? And by the way, when you do that, you really see the cost trend lines drop, drop down significantly. We elected not to do that. We elected not to do that for two reasons. Reason number one is that we strong, felt very, very strongly that if you're going to have a healthy workforce, they're going to have to live in a healthy community, right? I mean, the kind of care that we want for our employees, it's got to be available to their mothers. It's got to be available to the broader community, right? I mean, that's, it's, it's not, you know, we were concerned that it would fragment, right? You would have a core of folks who could get access to good care if you happen to be at IBM, and if not, you know, that care would be... It literally, in, in Las Vegas, when that happened, when companies began to do that themselves, the ability for our mothers to get an appointment with Medicare almost stopped. So that was one thought. The second, and probably an equally important, is that our employment model is one in which IBM employees now live everywhere. I mean, I have literally not been to my office in two years. I don't know if I even still have one. I don't care, right? So our employees live and work out of every zip code, right? So that model would work if you have a concentration of lives. But if you have, like many companies, 
folks that are working from everywhere, it's very hard to manage that model. I mean, I think that there's real value in taking, as, as Mayo Clinic did, Mayo Clinic began to open up on-site or, or retail-like clinics, right, where they had after hours availability of nurse practitioners, but that was all integrated and coordinated for their own employees, mind you, right? And then they began to add that to the whole community. I think that if it's integrated and coordinated, it can add a huge amount of value. I think, I think it's just one more thing to fragment, it's not gonna add value. Um, we'll take one more question. Um, Dr. Thought, please, can you come one minute here? Uh, I know several of you do have to leave, so we'll field questions for a few more minutes. Uh, just to let everyone know, part three of the Human Service Council Healthcare Transformation Series will be over me and for you. So just please check your inboxes um, for time and location for that event. Um, we'll continue, but please feel free to leave if you do need to. And meaningful use has got to be meaningful, you guys. In our practice, we have a patient portal. Awesome. We have uh, about 8,000 patients. Less than 1% participate in this patient portal, although 80% Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too discouraged about that. We found that happening in Denmark uh, when we first started that 15 years ago. It really started slow. We really began to have only one or two or three percent of the population using the portal. It really took a bit of education and time to get people used to using it. Um, you, I might want to hook you up with the folks in Grand Junction, Colorado, the Clinica Salud, where they began working with the Medicaid population with portal solutions. One of the things that they did, which was really interesting, was they began to identify um, where folks who had Medicaid could access internet. Um, and they began to look at feeding clinics, they began to look at um, churches, they began to look at libraries, they began to look at community health centers. They began to look at actually putting a kiosk in the practices where they could access it right there in the practice. Because a lot of times in the Medicaid population, you know, they, do, they really don't have a lot of access. Uh, there's a little company called Health Partners, um, which does a kiosk around that that's actually in the practice. And the other thing we found in that, and that was in Philadelphia, was that if you bang them up against their portal in the practice while they're still there, right? They go out of your office, they go to the portal, they engage the portal, you know, and then, and then that follows them home, they're much more likely to, to have uptick. We went from 2% in one practice, Joe Mambu uh, in Philadelphia, to over 30 within about a year and a half with, with that. But, but don't be too discouraged because I think that's a common, you know, process where, where you, I mean, it's kind of like when they first offered us tickets, right, where we could get it on our computer and we didn't have to go to the, the counter. I mean, many of us still went to the counter. Now, now none of us do. But, but I think that that's a learning process. Don't get too discouraged. I think I have time for one more. Yeah. More of a go rope when you don't have a lot of... Uh, Repeat the beginning because we didn't hear it. Sorry. Uh, a lot of us try to apply this approach in rural Oklahoma where you don't have near the, the embellishment uh, of it, I suppose, that Oklahoma City and Tulsa would have. A, is there, is there a clearinghouse for, because sometimes you feel like you're practicing in a silo. Uh, and is there, is there a clearinghouse for ideas and concepts? For well, the, the PCPCP that? is one of those clearinghouses, right? And if you want to have a discussion about that topic, would love to entertain it, would love to do a webinar on it, would love to have some folks from rural practices talk about what they're doing. But, but I love to be a connector, too. Right across the border from you in Arkansas, they've spent a lot of talk, time on that very topic. And I visited, there's a guy named Randall Oates, who's a proprietor of Soapware, who spent a lot of time on trying to help. He calls it leave no doctor behind. How do you put in place the basic tools and technology that's really affordable in a rural practice to allow them to, so this, this, this example of this practice that I just described in Arkansas was actually one of those Soapware practices. Um, and I know that David is talking to Randall because you, you're too 
your two areas are adjoining each other. You've got a, a medical home pilot with CPCI that goes to their border, and they've got one that comes to your border, and I think that they're beginning to communicate. But I would encourage you to talk to Randall Oates um, about identifying, you know, those basic tool sets that can really empower not leaving a doctor behind who's in a rural practice because they have a different set of needs. But, but, but when they get it right, when they get it right, like in the Adirondacks, which were all rural practices, it's really powerful. Because those guys, they already know all their patients, right? I mean, that's, those are communities that are already connected. And there's not anything that happens in that community that doctor doesn't already know about, whether he wants to or not. Thank you very much, you guys.